2018 is set to be the year the world fully embraces the electric car. We'll see a global tipping point for drivers as electric models start competing with petrol and diesel cars head to head. In 2018, for the first time, we're going to see that it's cheaper to buy an electric car than a petrol or a diesel car. And by cheaper, we mean the total cost of ownership. We're going to see acceleration of the whole idea of cars powered by electricity. But we'll also be confronted with the uncomfortable truth about the impact of going electric. What kind of incentives and features of EVs do you find most effective in persuading people to buy them? Truthfully, it is the government-funded incentives that they give out for the i3s, the X5s, the 7 Series, that it's up to like $7,800 off the price of the car. Okay. And that actually, surprisingly, or not surprisingly, people love even on the higher-end cars. Yeah. For people who just show up, we have so many of those credits to offer people and we have such a great way of, of transferring government funding to our own funding to help people out. One thing that we can do to help people is offer more charging stations. So it is something Colorado in Boulder is doing very well is they're incorporating these charging stations all over. So okay. whether you're at school, you're out yeah. to like eat dinner, uh, you're grocery shopping, if you're able to charge your car whenever you can, you're basically eliminating that anxiety range. Uh, my name is Nigel Zeed. I work at Boulder Nissan. I've been here 11 years. I am the EV specialist and I've been an EV specialist for uh, seven years. So right now in Colorado, we are probably one of the best states to be buying an EV from a, an incentive perspective. Uh, we have the 7,500 federal tax credit, up to 7,500, depending on what you have paid to the feds this year. Uh, we have $5,000 state tax credit, which is just a straight 5,000 uh, that we can actually take off at source. Uh, we're the only manufacturer that's doing that because it means we have to hold all of these 5,000 rebates to the end of the year and then claim them back from the uh, state. Uh, but it certainly helps people if they are uh, payment driven or they don't want to wait until the end of the year to, uh, to claim their 5,000 state. And then there are other rebates available. One is through Nissan, which is 0% financing up to 72 months. But there's also another program which is uh, uh, with XL. And XL is up to $3,000 off as long as you're an XL customer for either gas or electricity. My name is Jonathan Miller. Uh, I own a Nissan Leaf um, and I bought it uh, just about a year ago. Well, so there was a number of components that went into it. Uh, you know, uh, I think that the Leaf presented a certain type of vehicle for us that we didn't want to pay a ton for um, because it, it covered a lot of the needs we had, but not all of them. Um, so there was a state, a uh, federal, and a utility incentive available to us. Um, and those three combined made the LEAF very affordable, kind of made it a no-brainer uh, to get into a new car um, that, that kind of filled this very specific niche that we were needing um, in, as a functional piece in our life. So my name is Kathy Nicholson, and I have a Nissan LEAF. It's a 2015, um, and we got it at the very end of the year. So we've had it almost three years now. So I had a car that was 15 years old that I loved, um, and so my husband and I fought a lot about whether it was time to replace it or not. And so he'd always he works for Renewable Choice Energy, so he works for a renewables company as well, and he's always wanted to have an electric vehicle. So he'd been pushing that for a couple of years, and I basically finally gave in because between the federal, state, and then we bought it from the Boulder Nissan dealer who had a discount as well. Um, and then they let us finance it over six years at zero percent. So mm -hmm. it just made it kind of, you know, it felt cheap <laughs> yeah. to buy it. Um, 
and I have really loved it. I've had no regrets at all about it. What do you think will happen to the market response of Tesla and GM losing their tax credits? I think they're still going to sell a lot of cars. Uh, perhaps they will discount uh, their price to make it as appealing as it is right now. It's sort of an unknown, really. We've had this uh, help with payments and keeping the cost of the car down, which has obviously made it appealing to people. So it will we'll be interesting to see what happens when they go away. But the cost of, say, a, a, a bolt or a leaf is very comparable with uh, the average cost of a car in, in America is about $33,000. So we're not far away from that anyway. Uh, as far as oil in, and gas is concerned, um, I think they don't necessarily realize how important their product is. Uh, there's nothing like oil uh, on the planet. There's nothing that makes as many things as oil does. The clothes you're wearing, the drugs you take, the, the shampoo you use, the plastics we have, the fertilizers for our fields, everything. Mm -hmm. And we're burning through it at an, an appalling rate. And I don't think necessarily the oil and gas companies see that. They're not really, it seems, interested in future generations. Uh, it's all about a an, an now thing. And um, it's going to be a long time. It's like with dealerships and their fear of it changing a business model. Mm -hmm. So that right now it's like, well, what's going to happen when everyone's driving electric cars and you're not really doing any repairs or service? Well, that's going to be a long, long time away, you know, 30, 40 years. All the people that own a dealership right now are either going to be um, retired or dead. Uh, and it's not really going to affect them. But the reality is that it's coming, whether you like it or not. So it's sort of like a second industrial revolution, I think, for vehicles, is that we are flipping from oil to electricity. And in a lot of places, it will work. And other times, you'll have to have hydrogen fuel cell or CNG or propane for your bigger vehicles, maybe. The more we use electric vehicles, the more risk there is the instability across oil producing nations is going to increase. Beyond oil, attention will turn to lithium electric car batteries, which rely on the mineral cobalt. Two thirds of the world's cobalt comes from one country, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Congo is not only one of the world's poorest countries, but it is also a country uh, which is renowned for violence, uh, for for corruption, for the use of, of child labour and for environmental degradation. Demand for cobalt has doubled over the past five years and is set to triple by 2020. My initial take with electric vehicles was, um, or the process I went through, was dealing with range anxiety. Um, and the need to fuel your vehicle and to make sure that it would suffice in terms of getting you from here to there. Um, I think that there's a lot of optics that go on right now. So when you see like electric vehicle charging at your rec center or at the mall or whatever, there's the idea, oh, okay, you know, there's another point where I could be more um, flexible with my electric vehicle or I could make it fit into my life or there, it's just another reminder. So um, talking about, you know, how, how many times would this range not totally fulfill your need, it's, it's an extremely small percentage. Yeah. Um, and if you have another car, it's, it's a no-brainer. Um, I think there's a lot of cost savings. You know, I don't spend hardly anything on my fuel yeah. for this car. It's, uh, it's great, and I don't do any Maintenance, I don't do, I mean, I, I would say that there, there's a huge component to the electric vehicles is that they're absolutely hassle-free. The, yeah. the biggest hassle I've come, come to is that now that I'm not getting oil changes, I have to buy um, windshield wiper fluid. Teslas really are kind of the only ones that have any kind of range, mm -hmm. you know. Although my dad actually just bought a Bolt yeah. like three months ago, and it seems to have like double the range of a wow. Leaf. So he claims it's like over 200 miles. So that's a huge thing. I think, you know, the more 
innovation around that, mm -hmm. the more likely people are. Because I, I frankly am not sure, I know we wouldn't have bought it if we were a one car family. Mm -hmm. You know, just, you can't go to the mountains, you can't, yeah. You know. Well, I think one question that came up for me a lot is, it's kind of an unknown, and as the car ages, you know, what is the battery life? What, what really is the maintenance? You know, like I've been told it's really brake jobs and that's kind of it. Mm -hmm. But I feel like, you know, we've had the car almost three years and it's never been in for anything other than like it's checkup, you know? But that's my biggest concern of like, what do I not know? And so maybe, maybe that falls under education anyway, but I do think it's different enough that there's gonna be a lot of hesitation for people that, you know, are not, leading an adoption yeah because that's the other thing that you don't realize until you buy one the effect the cold has on your range which is tremendous and the effect that the terrain has on your range too you know like it'll say oh you can go 80 miles but if it's 20 degrees and i'm doing a lot of this it may be very different since evs only make up around two percent of the total u.s vehicle market what role do automakers have in increasing that percentage uh every role really yeah. uh and, and it really is it's outreach and education which is what it's about it doesn't matter if a car is ten dollars if people don't know about it or they're not educated about it they're not gonna be buying it and so you have to be able to go out to the general public and say you know how far do you drive in a day uh, what's the furthest you ever drive? Can you plug in at work? Can you plug in at home? And if that, if those are positive answers, have you considered an electric vehicle? So.